The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So I'm a bit busy this morning, but we can start with a question so we get get things going. All right. Okay, Bhante. Um, my question is: When is the right time? When do you know that you want to be a monk? What? It's, it's just that. Um, I have many doubts in that I've got no attachments <laughs> as far as families and everything goes. But I do have my doubts in terms of um, one doubt is not being able to sit in a lotus position. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another doubt is not being able to learn Pali. Um, third doubt is um, I've got elderly parents that need looking after. Um, so there's a few things that's, that I have a lot of doubts with, mm -hmm. but I've been, ex I've been exploring this issue for quite some time, and I keep coming back to the same, same issues over and over again. And also my age, I'm well into my midlife, mm -hmm. and um, so is there a cut-off point where you decide you don't go into a monastery, or, or how do you know when you're ready to become a monk? Mm. Well... I I thought I was old, and I was 29 when I thought about this, so I wasn't middle-aged yet. But <clears throat> um, I asked this one monk, and uh, similar question, exactly, exactly those words, this, uh, that I don't know whether I should be a monk or not. And I went to ask this Sri Lanka monk, who's, uh, fortunately, I, I don't remember his name now, but he was teaching at our place in Perth in a retreat center in Janagov. And he said, you know, just you, you can be a monk when you know 100% you want to be a monk. And I wasn't 100% sure, and I still went forth. So I don't think it was that valid of an answer. So <clears throat> coming back to those, all those questions you have, whether you, you, you have to be able to sit in a lotus position in order to become a monk. Well, no. You can sit on the chair. It does any Buddhist, the, the, the idea that we have to sit in the lotus position, I don't know. It's a, just a tradition where the, it's comfortable to sit if you get used to it. But if you're not used to sitting in, in, on, on the floor, it's not very comfortable. And it doesn't, doesn't disqualify you being a monk. Although all the, a lot of times we sit on the floor, so at least if you're more or less comfortable in the floor, it's okay. Uh, uh, being that you cannot learn Pali, well... You don't have to learn Pali either. I mean, it's 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 a very good idea and to learn it while you when you become a monk. And but what happens? You it's almost like a, like a cohesion. You you are surrounded by this stuff all the time with the you know words of the Buddha and a lot of things which words it's it's difficult to translate like kamma or you know or you know samsara. A lot of these words, they, they, they have so many meanings that we always left them really untranslated in many places. Bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, kutis, all those things. You're all the time surrounded by these words. You, you, you learn them by heart because, just because you're surrounded by them so much. And then your interest gets, gets you, you, you are interested. Why does it, why, why do we say think these things and then you if you com look at them side by side once in a while it's the some people are interested some people are not i know monks who are not interested at all they don't they know just basic pali and that's good enough i i live with the scholars like somebody like ajahn pramali pande suchato even ajahn pram his his knowledge is really good and their mind goes for that they don't Really, they don't have to put effort, but they cannot keep away from studying this stuff. And it's it's we we're so lucky to have monks like that to be to be here with us at this time because it's Pali. It's still very different language from from English. It's a different time of of when they were thinking these things two and a half thousand years ago. We have to make them relevant for the, this time and age. So. Whether you have to, you know, sit and cross like it or learn Pali, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Well, then there's the answer, question about your parents. That is a bit more tricky. And, well, the good thing is, like, your parents live in Australia or? 
New Zealand. Well, anyways, at least in in you know New Zealand or, or Australia, wherever my parents are in Finland, I can I can rest assured that you know like the government will take care of them. There, there is enough system, and that's why we pay taxes. That's why we have you know high taxes. We try to avoid corruption, all these good things, because we will get old. We need those systems to be in place. You know, the the wealth, you know, welfare and all that. So, do you need to? I recently went back to Finland, was in my parents, and my my mom is all right with me, but being a monk now, more or less, being a. Actually, my eighth birthday was just recently. That we we entered the rains retreat, as many of you know. And as monks, we count up birthdays as when uh, how many reigns you've been a monk. And so everybody, if I go somewhere, I ask, you know, I ask the, you know, Bante, how long you've been a monk? And they say, you know, how many vassas? We say the vassas. So I'm eight vassas now. I'm eight, eight reigns. So we count our, our age in vassas, how many reigns you've been a monk. So I'm only eight years old. So don't ask, you know. Difficult questions. If you go to an eight-year-old, you don't start asking in the meaning of the universe. You ask something like, "Which school do you go? <laughs> Who do you, you have a lot of play, you know kids to play with?" So you you can ask that kind of questions. Is your parents good? Yes. Yeah. So I can answer that kind of questions. So um, uh, the you can you, so going back to the like my father was really he's still distraught about me being a monk and. If anything, maybe he's used to now me being a monk, but to live far away, and I don't. As a monk, quite quickly you realize that as a monk, you live in a monastery. To be outside as a monk in a normal society, you like fish out of water. You need the other monks. You need the monasteries. And that's, as you, again, Adrian gave the, the presentation maybe here before I got here, but Newbury Monastery is starting now, and we need those places for monks and nuns to live. The, the, the is, it's a place for really for monks and nuns to train, but even, even if you, let's say, you know, your training costs five years in the beginning, you're a junior monk, you don't really give that much teaching, you really have to take your time to learn your rules, you have to learn how to, sort of the robes. But uh, even then, it's so much easier for us to live in the monasteries, to live surrounded by like-minded people. And so I can go and visit, you can go and visit your family. You, you support them by that kind of thing that you, 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 you're still for them, you listen to them, but you know, you cannot physically do so much. I, you cannot support them money-wise. You give up your, your, when you become a monk after a while, you have to give up all your you know, assets and all that. So you, it's good to good idea to keep them for a while. And in our tradition, as a monk, you, you're not supposed to have money, but we have decided and in Ajahn Brahm's great wisdom that when you become a monk, you sort of, you left your, li you know, your lay life behind and all of those money you had behind, uh, you had before, you can consider that it doesn't belong to you. So I did that thing where I, I gave my assets, my father used to, t used to take care of it, and for five years, I still had my where I had whatever I had in a bank account. My father was access to that. I didn't consider it mine, but obviously, if I would have gone disrobed, and it would be still there for me, because it's it's really really uncertain when you become a monk. Is I mean, people I, we give this high fluting teachings about metta. You know, you have to be kind, and I really truly believe that you have the compassion and all that. And then afterwards, everybody come come to you and ask, start asking questions, like well, telling you. Oh, it's good for you to teach that way, but my co-workers, my office, it, you know, people start abusing me if I'm really kind. That's always the, you know, the, what everybody tells us when we teach kindness and compassion. Uh, but so the obvious answer is like, okay, well, just become a monk and nun, so you never have any problems. You can only be compassionate, and, you know, all your problems are faded away. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So it's very, very uncertain when you become a monk that you're going to stay as a monk for the rest of your life. A lot of monks, uh, I've known so many monks from my monastery who have, who have left the robes, and there's nothing wrong with that. And many, many cultures, is very common, Thailand, Burma, that you become a monk for a certain period of time, and it's considered that you're, you're almost like a crow up as a, as a human being when you become a monk. It's a very good thing to do. So I wouldn't, 
hesitated, even if you if you tried. Maybe it's difficult now for you to ordain in Australia, like you said, you're a bit older now. And it's hard for you to commit maybe rest of your life, really, really give up. Well, then go to somewhere else. Maybe as a Sri Lankan, it's difficult to go to Sri Lanka because the culture is not there. They don't, you don't have those temporary ordination. It's not really considered good. You're supposed to ordain for a long time. I heard we have a monk now in a monastery in, in Newbury, Pante Arana Vihari, who teaches here, and he's saying it's changing a little bit. There is a little bit of mother practice. You don't have to stay on the rose for the rest of your life. It's still it's more accepted now to disrobe even Sri Lanka. But definitely in, in Burma, Thailand, you can just do this kind of thing for some people even for two weeks. It's, I wouldn't really recommend that. At least commit yourself for I'm going to stay for the rains retreat, something like extended period. Uh, and then you really, at least you get a, more like the taste of what is being a monk. So if you do ordain, don't consider it's, it's I'm going to give up everything. I'm not going to even talk to my parents. I'm, not, I'm just going to give up my money. And then six months later, you said, well, well maybe, I don't know if it was the, such a great idea. Then, then it's difficult to, you know, to um, make up the ties again the, to the normal society. But for definitely, I mean, they, last week I was giving a talk about karma, karma. And I think it leaves a good impression in your mind. Uh, and I was talking about, you know, how most of the things we do is not actually our kamma. A lot of the things we experience is not kamma. And I, I, I quickly glanced through my the face uh, YouTube page, and there was like a lot of comments. Yes, yes, good. You know, Murita doesn't know what he's talking about. Good. Yeah, fair enough. I probably don't. So, you know, you can't ask eight year old too difficult to know about how the karma works. But uh, the. the there is a certain thing which like an imprint for your mind, which is almost like your kamma, which your kamma, your habit, will lead into next lifetime. When you had the kind of imprint in your mind, you did something powerful, like become a monk or a nun in this lifetime. Even if you disrupt that habit energy, is there. there's some kind of memory in, your, in there which will lead you into becoming a monk next lifetime. So consider that there will be a next lifetime ahead of you, especially since you're a bit older, maybe it's coming closer to the next lifetime. Just joking. <laughs> that you want to leave an imprint. The, your, your karma is almost like a ship. There's a big tanker which is moving. There's nobody really steering the ship. You think you're in, in charge, but there's nobody there, unfortunately. But there's a, it's almost like a big tanker. It's, it's going into the sea and it's going to one direction. You cannot push it in a, you know, change the direction. No matter how much you try to push, it doesn't really change. But it, it leads an imprint, and it, the ships keep steering into one direction if you give it to get input. Input. So I would, I would definitely recommend anybody to become a monk or nine. If, if, if you have any kind of inclination, even if you're an older person, you're not that old yet. But, um, and longer you are monk you know more the imprint it leaves and so I, I you know I would definitely try it or you know or have the wish to become you know be a monk or none this lifetime and it will lead you into you know into that destination next life I mean look at me I so many places I said I, I, I'm from Finland and the people ask like well you know why did you become a monk I'm the only Theravada monk from Finland. And so I'm a rare species, but there's something in my karma to lead me into this direction. I don't come from Buddhist country. And, you know, for you, the wish, you, you know, get, you get born in a good Buddhist you know, family or Buddhist country, or you, you come across with the Dhamma, it might, might not happen. And if you don't have the inclination, the interest, I mean, all of you people, you, I see you all the time here, you have the inclination and interest. Your ship will steer towards the, towards here, the Dhamma. And when you hear it again next lifetime, you recognize it. But if you are a person who, let's say you're a traditional Buddhist, you, you go and, you know, you, you do funeral for your mom and dad, you burn, you know, burn, uh, fake money or you go on to pujas once a year how much of an imprint will that lead you it, it, that takes you into your mind that it will when you hear the dhamma next lifetime you recognize and you go for that i don't think that much 
I was just talking to somebody. I, I did a funeral uh, this week. I think it was Thursday, and uh, and uh, Malaysian lady. She's been here a long, long time, and she passed away. And she was uh, she used to apparently come here, and so she wanted to have a Buddhist funeral. So I went to do the, her funeral, and so she, she put the effort and interest into being a. Buddhist. So you know, what does it mean to Buddhist? You 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 want to learn about the Dhamma. You want to give an ear. That's what the Buddha said. When somebody's teaching, give the ear to you know to the teachers uh, and the teachings. And I lost the train of thought. Anyways, so the we will all pass according our karma. Uh, you know, the your habits will take you the next lifetime. And if your tree has enough lean, I've been quite often using that. The simile that, the Buddha gave a simile that it's like a tree in the forest. If the tree has a lean into one direction, it will always fall into that direction. It doesn't suddenly, all of a sudden, when it's, there's a strong lean to one direction, it doesn't all of a sudden, you know, knock, knock itself upright and then go in the other direction. It doesn't work that way. The kamma is like that tree. It will always go into towards the lean. If the lean is there for towards the dhamma, like for me, coming from a rural, very a country pumpkin person, coming into contact with a good teacher like Ajahn Brahm and hearing the dhamma, and if if somebody asks me why I'm a monk, I really don't know. Because it was just that when, when I heard it, my mind leapt for it. My mind went for it, and I couldn't wait to become a monk as soon as I heard it. But for a lot of people, there isn't really, it doesn't even cross your mind. And I was just talking um, uh, with my driver that our people respect us so much, being a monk. And this morning I went to beautiful breakfast. There's so many things, and you know, people serve us, and you know, they think I'm a special guest coming to their house, just having a breakfast because we had to go somewhere. But for their families, they, for you know, their children, sorry, I'm not somebody's uh, d daughter and son, that to, if they would become monk and nun, would they be really excited about it? Maybe not. I mean, they're so respectful for the monks and nuns, but imagine if their daughter and son would say, oh, I'm going to be a monk and I'm going to be a nun. Would their family leap up in joy? I'm not sure, but they should be. As a good Sri Lankan parent, you should be so overjoyed that your your son is going from great university degree and they just say, okay, I think I'm going to be a monk. He's like, great, I'm so happy for you. But I don't think it happens often enough. I don't see too many uh, Australian Sri Lankans who are, uh, whose uh, family, whose uh, children are going to be monks and nuns. Not enough, not not by far. So it is a it's a great opportunity, and and so think that you know have the idea, have it strongly in you. Don't you know? Don't worry whether it's going to happen or not. But th that interest will take you that direction. And I we just recently had that um, our citizen group, our young and adults, and uh, in in the monastery, and I was we one of the. Um, topics they wanted to talk me to talk about was the um, idea of Kalyanamita, and I, I thought it was a, such a great, great, uh, great topic. And um, Kalyanamita, so Kalyana means uh, dear, something, somebody who's um, upholds good standards, who keeps sila, who keeps this kind of um, has a good moral and helps you. Mita means a friend, a friend who's holding, you know, who's helping you in going the right direction. And th th there's a teaching, a very famous teaching, of where the, uh, Ananda told the Buddha that, uh, the Buddha asked Ananda that uh, how important it is to have a good um, Kalyanamita. Uh, and, the, and the Ananda said it's half of the holy life, half of, you know, half of the ordained life is to have a good, good friend. And the Buddha said, don't say that, Ananda. It's it's the to totality of the holy life is a good friend, Kalyanamita, and it's so true. If you surround yourself by good people, 
you are you are steering yourself into that direction if you surround yourself with with worldly worldly minds which are going with the stream instead of going against the stream as we are trying to do you tend to just drift along with everybody else there is no nobody telling you ever that maybe should we do something else you're just going along what the society is telling you what parents are telling you what your and your 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 kalyanamitas are not very kalyanamitas you they they're not very wholesome friends because they're not ever trying to steer you in the direction of maybe we don't have to worry about so much about accumulating things maybe we don't have to worry about uh stressing out all these things because we are just running in this kind of circles and it's not going to lead us anywhere kalyanamita is actually the obviously the buddha was the the best kalyanamita the, the you know the highest you know we can really consider a friend then on the line comes maybe an arhant but even arhants are difficult to find in this in this day and age and this world so but so we have to rely on these buddhist societies and good monks which which we know that they are they gone somewhere whether they are and or not somebody famous like ajahn brahm ajahn pramali and those kind of teachers we we can understand they have a lot of knowledge and we we trust them enough that they seem to have something and they become our good kalyanamitas and then on our own abilities we try to help others that you know if somebody has problems in life we're trying to uh be there for them we're trying to um understand their sores but you know you have to as a good good friend you have to stand a little bit above that if you get sucked into that yourself as well into that sorrow and you know the loss and all that you almost like you well in yourself and you cannot in, in order to help somebody out of that hole you have to be outside of the hole yourself and to stay out of that hole yourself you have to realize that everything is impermanent it's not something to rely on this world everything is inherently suffering everything there's nobody really there the suffering will follow you anywhere so these just these basic teachings and that's why as buddhist monks we keep honing them in all the time and i i been get honed with from ashram pram all these other teachers that those are the basic teachings and we if if we don't have the right aim in the life if the right right um view you are going to go the wrong way so the, it starts from the right view and the right view comes from those kalyanamitas from the buddha from the beginning but even the buddha himself said that you know i i he, that he didn't say he he was first to you know discover the truth the buddha just remembered the the teachings from the past he didn't rediscover anything which wasn't there before he heard it from the previous lifetimes and it, you know the cycle just keeps going there's nothing special about the buddha buddha was the first you know again you know the the teachings were you know they were forgotten and then rediscovered again when the buddha remembered he had a deep meditation experience samadhi and then he remembered them and it's same for us so we we have to just keep applying ourselves and we all going in the same direction starting again you know starting from the kalyanamita understanding the basic teachings so you have the right view if you if you don't have the right view wrong way you're going you're drifting along uh, we and everybody's everybody's drifting along in this like i said it's like a like a tanker i like that idea that it's a big ship because there's so much weight the, the load in the in your tanker is your kamma and it's it's really it doesn't move very swiftly in this in in this ocean tankers don't move quickly it's just we think you're steering and you're making all this i'm going to change myself and even when the citizen was there and all this like oh i i want to change myself where well, you can't really do that don't try to change yourself you're changing the attitude have compassion have loving kindness whatever you do meta in your heart and you just keep applying 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 and then that will steer you towards one direction you become more compassionate kind person but if you somehow 
thinking that you're going to be more efficient and wise in this world you're going to alleviate the suffering from everybody else and for yourself you're going to be somehow have this idea of mindfully going along and you're not going to get you know you don't going to suffer you become smarter it's not going to happen i'm here to tell you um, that's it's not going to happen life is not going to give you anything what it already has a famous buddha saying that oh what joy what happiness uh, uh, you know, what a place. There is no joy in this world. Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> There's, there is really not, you know, you're not going to find the ultimate joy and happiness in this life or the next. You know, it is, those two things are giving, you know, the, it's, we have good joys, great happinesses, you know, caring about, caring about your families and your, somebody, your, your, your loved ones. But you, we have the suffering of you have to let them go. People die. Uh, we have to associate with idiots, unfortunately. Even if you, you know, come in the monastery, but at least you know you you change your perception. It was like, oh well, you know, you're not you, you're learning from these idiots in the work. And you know, it's I know. I mean, it's not very kind to say you know stupid people. But the the only thing you're not gonna change the world well it, it is what it is and for me it's such a great blessing to live in the monastery where i'm i'm really i'm surrounded by kali and amita another good point why do you want to live in a monastery we are really genuinely living amongst people who are thinking the same way not maybe we have cultural differences and all that but if i didn't have these two great monks now I'm living with, Pante Chunda and Pante Arana Vihari, I really would feel lost in the monastery. They they are, I know they have the best interest on their heart towards me, and they're always acting uh, that they they are going in the same direction as well, and they keep putting me in the right place. And I, I hopefully do the same for them. And I, I, I really have to have a lot of, gratitude, gratefulness for just these two monks who are with me in the monastery now. And I look at them kindly and towards their, you know, their actions and towards their minds. And, you know, and then when I do that actively, I, it was so easy for me to go negativity. And I lived with Bhante Chunda since I was ordained eight years ago. And sitting right close to him for so many years, it would be so easy for me to go into negative thinking and start seeing the little things he does differently than I do. That is, is what he's accumulated his habits from his family or his culture. And I, I do the same. It's so easy. And I can see it so many relationships. It's so e after, you know, how, long, how many years does it last to be a nicely happy and nothing matters? Oh, she, it's so cute when she does that. Oh, he's ha handsome when he gets angry. Maybe two years. If you're lucky. Three, oh yeah, okay, starting to feel wear off, but thin. But after that, you know, it's very easy to go into negativity and start seeing the mistakes she does, he does. Nobody's perfect. So that's why we have to really effort, put effort into it. It's like, oh, that's nice. She's putting up with my company all these years. And he's sticking with me you know like uh, my imperfections and you so you and you you appreciate that person and it really takes effort and if you don't put that effort you your mind there's this natural tendency of your mind is being negative it's like that thing you know everything goes well and jo jolly you know all your day somebody says a one run thing and you just start dwelling on that one and you forgot all of the goodness of the whole day, and you wish you didn't even get out of the bed that morning because everything was bad, because you concentrated on just that one negative thing. And the mind has that tendency to do that. So again, you know, so we have to keep at it. We have to keep at it, being compassion towards ourselves, loving kindness, all that. If we don't do that constantly, we're not gonna change your, our perceptions. And if you don't have the right perception, Again, you you're not going in the right direction. So that's why we need this Buddhist society. We need monks and nuns. We need to, but 
for everybody we need to keep pra practicing it if you come here listen mudito and you think oh couldn't you know couldn't as well it's good for him to talk about it again like i said he's monk he can he can practice about the compassion as long as he you know wants and he's everything is good he lives in the monastery but in the real world no you have to keep keep at it towards yourself you have to keep compa you know be compassionate towards yourself be compassionate have loving kindness in the heart starting from yourself i've been teaching that everywhere i go to the umph degree that if you don't have metta towards yourself Bandhasujada who come uh Nisarna who comes here to teach usually every year and it should be him teaching right now here he always says if you don't have money in the bank there's nothing you can give if you if you don't have metta towards yourself you don't you know consider yourself as good enough have compassion for yourself how you know good of a person you're doing the best you can if you don't have that money in the bank you cannot give start from yourself you know i'm good enough i really can be kinder towards myself you cannot be too kind for yourself it's you know it's it's uh, it's just it doesn't happen but this, if you keep at it keep you know like okay you're going into the rut again i'm um, depression started to creep in there's a co you know confusion this kind of doubting i've noticing that i have i haven't had time now enough to practice the uh, the doubt starts coming to my mind am i good enough a monk does people appreciate me uh shouldn't maybe i shouldn't be a monk this this doubt and it's really toxic it's really not a nice feeling when you have doubt in your mind so what can i do just all of a sudden start practicing you know 24 hours a day and you know read all the books so i can teach these good teachings no the only thing i can do is have compassion towards my mind just see the doubt and say that's fine that's good enough uh, it's it's nothing wrong about having doubt have compassion towards it don't try to push it away and then it's easier to live with it and if you keep at it it gets easier and easier and the doubt self criticism doesn't really creep in it's it's further and further away that you know that spiky thing there it's for, it keeps it further and further away and then if you meet somebody like Ajahn Brahm that you know obviously he's got amazing th things like he can meditate and all that but he doesn't doubt himself he doesn't have depression he doesn't have ill will towards himself it just doesn't happen he might be frustrated about it, that you know he's so busy and he comes back from United States Singapore he's been traveling so many weeks and then he comes and he's tired and all that but it 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 doesn't affect him like normal people like you would carry it in your mind as if you know you you are angry of your tiredness or something like that he doesn't carry anything like that so that's why it's 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 amazing to live with somebody like Ajahn Brahm when you can see that obviously he's kind towards you but it flows from him because he's kind compassion towards himself and it just flows out of him very naturally so it's a quite a nice nice thing to see that person is actually living the teachings and really these are the teachings of the buddha the there's a lot of things from the historical teachings of the uh, the buddha like the buddha was teaching because he had the highest compassion and this and that might not be the accurate accurate things that those might be the later additions a lot of things we are taught as a you know like this kind of popular buddhism which might not be the actual you know the buddha's teachings then and, and you know the buddha went middle of the night he left his wife and rahula his son behind and he rode off the buddha himself never taught those those are later additions and that you know so it seems to be that the buddha was actually he was compassionate but he, he was he was teaching out of because he he realized the suffering he realized that the you know death is in, in inevitable in this world so those that's the reason why he was teaching not that he was the ultimate most compassionate person in the world so that if you know the buddha realized those things he didn't suddenly all of us you know come out of the 
non-existent world where you know he realized oh what this this sickness and old people and all that those are the you know the stories which were added on to the buddhism the buddha realized that death is in, in, inevitable and that made him practice he said if if i don't get out of this cycle of samsara i'll just get born again and what bam you get sicknesses all day sickness death it was just you just follow with the cycle so he was said listen there's something wrong with this i i'll try to find a way out of here and so he put the the wheel rolling and we just following from these things but it you know it starts from that you come to these places you have kalyanamitas we teach you about compassion kindness you change your perception you're going the right direction you don't think this you know the you don't put the value into certain things what the, everybody else put value in and you then you we are going the same direction there's nothing you can do about it so don't worry about it don't try to steer the bus the bus is going just sit on relax be kind easy how easy is this buddhism is easy religion not much to do be kind how difficult is that it's pretty difficult Okay, let's ask more questions. Seems to be I'm starting to repeat myself. So, dear Bhante, I understand and believe the power of the mind. As it is almost there is an evil m myself inside, releasing all negativity thoughts during meditation. Hmm. I'm really struggling and exhausted after meditation. Should I keep enforcing all positive messages during meditation? How do I overcome this? Every time I think of a positive message, the negative one comes up over the positive one. Mm, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is like, because uh, you don't really mean it. Uh, it that, that's why it takes so long to change your... I mean, it's, it's, a very, very, it's a very easy for the mind to, um, to go into negativity. And it's very easy to go into the doubt, like I said. That's why the practice is... It's an ongoing thing, and we keep at it. And you, it's almost like you fake it until you make it. And all of a sudden, you realize when you look 10 years back how I used to be, and I don't really like the minds that I used to, mind states I used to have. So when you, when you see that, the practice actually works. It motivates you. So you have to have a little bit of longer, you know, um, uh, perspective have a little more little bit more time don't think that it didn't work this week well it's not going to work next week either well okay, no you have to look a bit further down and then it's 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 really difficult when you have those mi mind moments where it's just black and bleak and all that it's it, 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 it's almost like it's it's worse when there's nothing happening it's this kind of the the depression it's it, there's and it happens for us as well during the rains retreat sometimes you you th for three months you don't do anything you just pick up your food and you go back and keep practicing for from morning to the dawn and uh, and uh, and and, and you, you you don't sleep that much and you just keep keep at it you walk back and forth and you sit down and it's hard to find happiness in the mind it really is hard it's like how can you all of a sudden create happiness out of thin air it doesn't come if you just keep keep sitting and it's just all of a sudden you just somewhere generate it comes from those you know from the previous actions previous good good deeds you've done you know kind words and being kind towards the, it's again it's kind action towards yourself really you have to look the mind with kind eyes you have to keep actively practicing kindness towards those things if you if you try to bring you know you somehow you think oh, i'm gonna have this kind idea and that's gonna erase that negative thoughts it it might not work that well because you just your intention wasn't good enough for somebody like who's who's got a good meditation again somebody like Ajahn Brahm, he can just think of jhanas and in mind he doesn't talk about it, but you know this is comes from the suttas. That is somebody. Oh, oh, I wonder if it's coming true. Anyways, the to to think of jhanas, you pr it brings so much happiness in your mind 
that your mind automatically calms down and it, it leaps towards that. It, it almost, it's so pleasurable. Good meditation is so pleasurable that once you start getting it, your mind automatically goes there. So that's why it's so important to keep practicing and don't give up because it's once you start getting into the happiness of meditation, it's so self-sustaining fire then. But until then, you will struggle. But it, I always say it's a good struggle because you're struggling to become a kinder person. I like that idea. I like the idea that we don't try to be become wiser. Somehow we can be smart in this world to you know erase suffering. We are only thing we are trying to do now in the beginning to be kinder, more compassionate, and you know towards yourself. And how difficult is that? Whatever works for you. If it's you know go and you know, pat the dogs in the park or do something, you know, feed, feed the, uh, the ducks, something like that. It uplifts the mind a little bit. Everybody wants to be happy and it's, it's so much nicer when you have a mind which is uplifted. Who wants to live in that, in the rat of darkness? Nobody wants to do that. So wherever you find this kind of happiness which generally uplifts your mind, it puts a smile and you, when you, can, you, you feel inside lighter, whatever that is, we just keep at it. So it's, it's a, okay, it's, it's, it's hard practice, but it's, it's a nice struggle. I, I like that idea, it's a nice struggle. And that's what we have to do. It doesn't, it doesn't change your mind automatically, but when you learn how to go into the one direction, then you, you're going into the certain directions. Again, how to change your perception? For me, it's that I look things with gratitude. I look Banda Chunda and Arana Vihari with kindness. I think of my friends in Porinyan, Ajahn Pramali, Ajahn Pram, whoever the other monks who've been teaching me. I feel gratitude, a lot of gratitude for them. I, I look at the food, what people feed me. I was a chef, I, like I said, you know, many times. I, I, I could easily see the mistakes in the food. And as a chef, not trying to put down anybody's food. <laughs> as a chef, you start hating the food because you only see the mistakes. Especially when you work in a, in a high-end restaurant where I used to work. You only see the mistakes. But if you see that the mothers and the fathers sometimes, they wake up early, cook the best food to bring the monastery to the, you know, to the Buddhist Society of Victoria. And it's a lot to do with because monks are coming today. I look at it with gratitude. And when I look at the food with gratitude, it's, it's so much nicer. You can see that it's somebody put good effort into it. If you, as a grandmother, you make a cake for your grandchild. Or as a grandchild, you make a cake for your grandmother. You don't look... It's like, oh, you know, it didn't turn out the best. You, you still feel, even you know, you okay, you see the mistake. Okay, well, you know, I'm not very good at making the, you know, the cake. They make the cream look really nice like they do in the shops. So it looks a bit of a f flop. You just flop on the cream on top of the cake. But, you, you know, you did the best. And you really, up in your mind, you feel good about it. Because you made it to somebody you care so that's why, you know, you, that's the way you change your perceptions. You, you change your perception, look at the, you know, gratitude towards your good fellows you're living with, the good societies you are in, your, 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 your actions, towards your own actions. You're, you're trying your best. You, you look at yourself with gratitude, kindness, compassion. You, that's, you, you change your perception. That's how you do it. You, it's good. In, you're good enough. Don't worry about it. Everybody has... There's nothing wrong with you if you have dark moments. And the only way to change is it's your you know, changing a perception. Don't try to push them away. We we really we have to learn how to live with them. Very good. Is there more questions? Don't worry, we're getting close to the end. So if you're getting bored, I'm I'm I think bored of myself as well, so Yes, there is another ten question. More question. Ten more uh, questions. Ten more minutes. So you'll right. be right. How does the idea of Buddhism, no pleasure in life, encourage people with life-threatening diseases to be positive 
and gain strength through the desire to live, desire, desire to live, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. So everything is suffering, just give up, uh, you know, we're going to suffer the rest of our life and then it's going to be a miserable death. <laughs> Theravada Buddhism, we, we're so optimistic about life. Ajahn Chah gave the good simile. He, he, he took a class. This is a, uh, no, it's not a class, but um, Ajahn Chah used to take a cup, a glass, and he said, you see, there's a fracture in the cup. And he showed to the people, and people look at us like, no, it doesn't, I don't see any fractures there. He said, look carefully, there is a fracture there. And the fracture is minuscule. It's a tiny little fracture in a cup, in a glass, in, in that case. And he said, in some point the crack will open and you know the glass will break somebody will maybe drop the glass or put it too you know too quickly on the on the saucer and it will it will break the glass and that is the reason we need to care if the cup was made out of metal you could just bang it everywhere just chuck it you don't have to worry about it you don't have to be careful but because it's it's made out of porcelain or, or glass that's the reason we have to care. And the simile was, is for that we all have it, these fractures in, in ourselves. We are all in, imperfect, right? Who's perfect here? Okay, I can see a few hands there. No. <laughs> I, uh, I knew Sri Chut is perfect. I knew it. He's, he's always so good. He doesn't have any fractures in him. His mind is always pure. Metaculous, he's so happy his wife's looking at the Nazi, shaking her head. <laughs> and uh, uh, now we all have those fractures, and that's why we have to care. We all have the mo you know, moments when we need somebody to care for us, some more than others. And if we don't care, well, if, if, we th if there wasn't fractures, we wouldn't have to care. But because we are subject to suffering, you know, illness, uh, old age, and all those things. We need to care, and it brings happiness for us to care. But also, because it is in the life that that's how it is, then we need to be caring for the others as well, because we know they have these inside fractures, and they they can, they really, really suffer from, let's say, you lose your loved one. You have a divorce. How difficult is that? You know, it's it takes years to come you know, come by if you, you know, your, your husband leaves you or your wife leaves you. It's so difficult. And you, that fracture is then open. And if there's nobody there to care for you, well, if, if the compa you know, the, that's why compassion matters. That's why we, it matters that we are care for others. We are, don't just throw them around and don't think it matters. We have to place them down c gently, you know, pay attention to that be kind towards the cup, towards yourself, and towards others. And that makes it easier. The suffering is there, but we have, that's why we have compassion as well. It's nice to be you know, kind and caring and uh, uplifting others, because there's too many fractures in you. Very good. All right. I'm too easy. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs>